Hey there comic book friends, I'm Travis and this is a mixtape version of Monster Comics Reviews and No Capes. Why is that? Because I only have one superhero book to even remotely talk about uh, that Ethan reads along with me or whatever, however I want to say that, and uh, the rest of my books are all um, non-superhero, uh, non-cape, non-Ethan, either reads them or doesn't review them along with me. Of course, no, no Ethan today. Um, these are books for the last week of October. I am behind, but I am determined to catch up. Uh, the only thing that would fall under the superhero books, which actually isn't even a superhero book, so I probably could have just done this whole thing as a no cape, but I didn't feel like it because normally this falls in my superhero uh, world because it is a book that Ethan reads along with me, is Swamp Thing. Ish this is um, annual number two, um, written by Charles Soule, um, Javier Pina, and um, Kano do the artwork on this thing. Um, Tremendous artwork in it. Um, great story, basically, in this. Um, we get Alex Holland, a la Swamp Thing, um, has basically um, meets his... Um, oh, biggest supporter in the parliament. Um, you know, he basically wants Alex to be continue to be the Avatar. Of course, we got this whole... You know, um, Swamp Thing versus the Cedar um, thing that's go that's going on. Um, so basically, his um, you know biggest supporter kind of sends him on a mission to toughen him up and um, get him to understand how, what his capabilities are. So because there's going to be a fight, there's going to be a fight for uh, the fittest to see who is going to be the new Avatar, the Cedar or um, Swamp Thing. So he um, meets. Um, uh, this woman that kind of, it, it, well, woman, that kind of explains to him, another, you know, um, parliament person explains to him how he's not really this meat body anymore. He is the avatar. He is everywhere. He is everything plant-like and whatnot. And um, it explains a bunch of stuff to him as far as, you know, his abilities and that sort of thing. Um, then he meets, um, interestingly, he meets the Swamp Thing before him, who, who he is modeled after, who he actually thought he was for a period of time, um, and has an interesting conversation with, with that Swamp Thing as to, you know, how, how does he do it? How did he manage to do what he did for as long as he did? Him being literally a made creature, not, not, a, not a person who became who most of the avatars are is a person who embodies the green and then takes on that role. Um, he was literally a made thing um, from plant and and made to think that he was was human. Um, and that um, that avatar that um, uh, person um, basically tells him, "Look, you just have to know when to say no." You know, God, if the if the parliament asks you to do something that's going to fundamentally make you not you anymore, you, you have to learn to say no. Um, a really interesting story. Uh, I, I, a very valued, um, if you're into the Swamp Thing stuff, a very valued um, annual. Um, not like annuals where a lot of people say, oh, annuals aren't worth anything. They're just kind of a throwaway issue. Uh, certainly not in this case. Um here you go some of the other people said, wonderful, wonderful coloring in this book. I mean, it's all green, and it's amazing how well this colorist does at, at uh, uh, creating large fields of green that feel rich and don't just blur into itself into one thing and whatnot. Um, uh, uh, great book. This, this book just set me up to be really interested and excited to see what was going to happen with this fight between the Cedar and, um, and Swamp Thing. So, great stuff. That's it. That's it for my... Um, Cape um, stuff, you know it's not cape. Uh, no particular order. We're gonna talk other comics here. Talk the uh, no cape books. This is the two lives of the fabulous Killjoys. This is issue number five. Um, the only people I hear about that are collecting this book are collecting this book because they're already this many issues in. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be in. Um, I'm still digging it. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in the characters. I'm interested in where they're going and what they're doing. Some of the stuff feels spot on for me. I, 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 I just, okay, you know where this is going to go or this is going to head, that sort of thing. Oh, uh, 
But I still think it's really cool. I think the reality is really cool. I I'm not confused about what's going on in the book. I know a lot of people are. Um, it's all kind of lining up, it seems It seems to me. Uh, we get a, basically, in this issue, we see the origin of, of our little girl. You know, why is she so important? We, we find out why she's so important uh, by getting some back history about her mother and, and, and her own birth and um, what she represents um, and, the, and the threat that she is. Uh, we've got this you know, uber killer scarecrow guy who they're going to wipe his memory and um, instead of wiping the, his memory, he busts the place up. He has a way to uh, resist that. And um, so things are coming apart at Battery City. Uh, we've got our blue porn bot who is um, gets captured but escapes um, being um, eradicated um, and basically kind of finds the equivalent of of the robot's god, um, sort of. So, I'd be curious to see what happens there. Um, you know, I, I gotta guess as to what I think is going to happen as far as that goes. Um, our Violet kids are as crazy as ever. Um, Val, uh, this kind of leader of the gang, is kind of really going off the rails. Um, probably going to get them all killed um, if somebody doesn't do something different and whatnot. But, um, Still really digging it. I, I like this style of art. Um, it, yeah, I, think, I still think it's an interesting story. Um, yeah, it probably could be put together better than what it is. Um, but I guess it, this is one of those books I'm just kind of reading for the trip. Um, and, and not putting heavy stock into it telling me some sort of rich story. Um, I've done some more exploring. The thing's obviously based off of an album. Um, so, you know, how much is there? Um, and how much work did the writers put into making something more than what was kind of in the music? And I don't know what they did. Um, so there is that. But I'll, I'll keep collecting it through. I I've been enjoying it. I like Becky Coolen's art. So there you go. Oh, the long-awaited Sandman Overture, issue one. I got the Dave McKean cover. Um, I do like the J.H. Williams cover. It's pretty awesome, too. I may end up picking up that at some point also just to have both. But I wanted to make sure I had the McKean cover because, well, he did all the covers of all the other Sandman. Why would I get a new Sandman without him having done the cover, right? So, um, amazing, amazing story. Amazing, amazing art. Um, J.H. Williams is a brilliant artist. Uh, it shows here. It shows that... You know, he, he, he can do more than just, you know, his, um, the fancy stuff that he's been doing in um, Batwoman as late. He, you know, he, he has a style, he creates some cool panels, but it's not over the top. It's not, it's not, it's not picture book like um, some of the stuff has been in uh, the Batwoman stuff. Um, you know, he does an amazing job of, of, of um, drawing, um, plants as characters and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and so the art is just is brilliant, of course, um, with the um, genius that is um, Dave Stewart, uh, colorist. The stuff looks gorgeous. Um, so yeah, the art is brilliant. We all knew that though, right? We all knew the art was going to be brilliant all the way through it. Story-wise, story, -wise, story um, I was so scared of, of the, this book was going to um, not be able to recapture the magic that is um, this world, and and I think it's 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 done it's done so well. Um, very excited to see what happens um, in, in this first issue. We are we are given a, a landmine uh, of a piece of information, in my opinion, that completely changes potentially the way you would look at the rest of the Sandman series. Um, or at least it does for me. I, I, I'm almost positive now. By the time I'm done reading the Overture, uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the Sandman books again. And I just finished reading all ten volumes of the trade um, about a month or so ago. So... And you know, normally I'm not that eager to go back and read a book again, but just... The conversation between death and destiny in here and some of the things they say just make me kind of go, what? For the whole, se the whole series as far as what's, what, what happens. And the whole premise of this, of the Sam Overture, in my understanding is, is it's supposed to explain 
how Dream, why Dream was where he was at, where he was, and why he was in the state he was in when he gets captured at the very beginning of the regular Sandman run. Um, how did that happen? Him being who he was and as powerful he was, how did he get himself stuck there? So that's what this is going to be about. So I am very, um, very excited, very interested, very pleased to read this. So one thing, one piece of conversation we can have about this, is this something you can read if you've never read the other Sandman stuff? Yeah, I think you can. Uh, there may be parts of it that are a bit confusing. There are going to be things that are said and people are going to act in ways that I don't know that you're going to um, completely understand um, the significance of it. Um, but I still think you can read it. Um, I, I, I do think maybe you get more out of it. If you read the regular Sandman series, sorry for my yawning, the regular Sandman series um, before reading this, but pick it up anyway. The biggest frustration with this thing, it's bi-monthly. We won't see it again for two months. Next month, what comes out is kind of a director's cut sort of thing where it's got lots of back, um, lots of behind the scenes stuff about how J.H. Williams is doing, doing the artwork. And then we'll get a, a, a number two of the regular series. And then the next month we'll get some other director's cut of some sort and then so on and so forth. So uh, we've got a year to get the six issues. I think that this is going to be um, out. But brilliant, great stuff. Absolutely loved it. Okay, Richard Corbin's Interpretation of Ed God's Poe, The Raven and the Red Death. Um, oh, what can I say? It's, it's Richard Corbin. Um, if you love Richard Corbin, this is great work. It's, it's fun stuff. Um, I, I love his version of, of The Raven, what, what he had to work with and what he did instead of just a straight interpretation. Kind of made it something a little different. That was great. Um, Mask of the Red Death. We, I think he basically sums it down to the, the one important piece of it. Um, and, and it was fine. Is this the best of these um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe interpretations? Mm, I don't know. I like the Conqueror's Worm a lot be uh, better than this one. But still really, in, really enjoyed um, it. I like Richard Corbin's work. I would love to see him back on some sort of um, regular title. Um, but I'm also happy if he's happy doing these uh, these um, Edgar Allan Poe reworks. Great. Um, there's still a lot more um, Poe's that he could that he could redo that he could um, do. I'd love to see him do them all. And after he's done with that, let's let's find some other, um, you know, neo gothic whatever, you know, romance um, kind of. Um, author for him to interpret those if he wants to. I, I'm all happy with that, even though I know the story. I know it's going to be portrayed to me in a way that's going to be different. So, um, really enjoyed it. Um, the Mask of the Red Death, the colors were so striking for each of the different colored rooms and stuff. It was pretty brilliant. Anyway, great stuff. Five Ghosts, issue number six. The first of the ongoing now Five Ghosts. <clears throat> Very excited about that. This issue um, has a, um, uh, a different artist on it, Brown. Is a uh, um, stepped in for this issue. Um, I wouldn't really call him a fill-in artist. Um, he was actually asked to do this page um, while the other artist is working on the up and coming books. He'll be back. Still, his artwork great. His artwork great for this. Told a really good story. A one and done. Um, there are some somewhat uh, stereotypical trope in it to some degree. Um, you know the whole. You know. Um, martial arts samurai master and the daughter, you know, and him having a, you know, a love interest with a daughter while he's being trained by the master kind of a thing. Uh, but still really interesting, really cool, uh, really, um, you know, uh, it has some bizarre moments in it that, that lend itself well to, um, what we expect from this book. Um, you know, the, there's not tons of dialogue in this. There never has been any of the five ghosts. Lots of times it's just lots of pictures and action and stuff. I'm really happy with that with this book. It works for this book really well. Would I want every one of my books to be this way? No, just like I don't want every one of my books to be a whole bunch of talking heads either. But some books capture what they do really well, and this one does that. It it, it has enough freshness, enough you know, pizzazz to it to just make it a, a really fun um, read. It it. For me, it still has that, that feel of the, I'm a little kid, 
uh, back when you only had cartoons on early Saturday mornings, that sort of thing, you know, that newness of a new cartoon, uh, of just the wonder of, uh, and the joy of seeing it and just, you know, um, getting a lot of fun out of it. And that's what this book is. Um, I, I don't, you know, think it, I mean, it, it has, it has moral and emotional depth to it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it just, it's just this fabulous romp of this guy with these spirits in him, um, you know, kind of exploring and adventuring the world. It's just great. Love it. And finally, the wonderful saga with this great cover of um, it being kind of a romance novel. Um, another, what I think is a brilliant book. I love saga. I don't think it's had a bad issue ever. Uh, I think these last Four or five issues have been, you know, since they've been to the tower, have been absolutely brilliant. Um, the dialogue, the conversations that are had are just absolutely incredible. Um, our extended family um, plays uh, basically this really bizarre board game that opens up all kinds of great conversation about people getting jobs or not getting jobs. Just all kinds of real, real stuff to have conversations about. And, and I just think it's absolutely brilliant um, how how well Brian K. Vaughan writes this incredible stuff. Um, this, these conversations just feel like conversations that could happen. Um, uh, it just, yeah, it, I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, the, and we, we also, we finally figure out what the hell's going on with the whole, this whole stock thing uh, that's been going on, that's been haunting the will and whatnot. And that's kind of gone to hell in a handbasket um, very, very quickly with the planet they're on and stuff. I'm curious to see how they get out of that. Um, but, um, but definitely um, curious. Um, and I'm curious to see how it's going to affect the Will's ex-girlfriend. Is her name Melody? That doesn't sound right. Can't remember what her name is right now. But I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how it affects Marco, Marco's um, ex-girlfriend. How that's going to affect that. Um, it'll be really, really interesting, I, I think, because uh, we haven't really seen what's going on with her yet, but really curious about that. Um, the only thing I have to say, oh, one thing I have to say about this book, you guys that are reading this, did, does the artwork seem duller in, in this issue? Um, oh, another great character. We get the, the Countess. She's somehow related to Prince Four. Her TV screen is blank most of the time. And when it's not blank, it's some violent, like, you know, shells raining down from guns and that sort of thing. We also find out another nugget about Alana, the fact that, um, you know, she's obviously had a conscious and been, and been somewhat objected to the, uh, uh, has some objections to the war and its behaviors. Anyway, we get a story about her not wanting to fire upon um, some citizens. I mean, she ends up doing it. She does a perfect job of it. Just makes me like Alana all that much more. Um, if I was going to have a comic book girlfriend, it would definitely be Alana. Because she prays. Anyway, um, uh, but the the I don't know. There's something something seemed less than as far as the art goes. If I pull out an issue before this, um, things have a little more. They're not as dull. Uh, there's something about I don't know if it's the printing or or if it's the um, everything just seems a little flatter. Even this cover feels a little flatter. It doesn't have as much tone or something to it. And I can't figure out exactly what it is. And if it's just, maybe it's just me, uh, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so if you're watching this video and you collect this book, what do you think? Am, am I just kind of hallucinating? I've had a couple books now that I'll be talking about in the next week or so that the art just seems, I mean, it's the same people doing it, but something, something's changed. And did it change in tone? Is that what it is? It's just not, it's flatter? Or am I just crazy? Maybe I'm just crazy. Anyway, that's it for my books that I had for the last week of October. Um, that would be Halloween, probably. Um, thanks for watching. Um, as I've said, I hope to get back on track of more of this stuff. Um, uh, the disembodied voice is caught up on comics. She's actually reading the current comics that I'm reading. So I'm hoping that means that um, if not for um, both the Monster Comics Review and um, No Capes, I can at least get her in on one of those. 
to um, talk some books with us because that's always a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, that's it. Um, have a great week, everyone, and I will see you the end of the next week.